in Nebraska 1989. A mysterious drifter called the police hotline to relate a shocking tale. He had called in and said that his people were trying to kill him. He felt like he was going to be shot in the back of the head. Before hanging up, the caller told police that he'd seen human remains at the scene of the crime, evidence of possible murder victims. Jack said that he'd seen what he believed was leg bones and skulls in these brush piles. Along with the police, there are those who chronicle the investigation in minute detail, on film, on paper, and on tape. Through their lenses, they capture the story of the elderly executioners. August 1989, Chillicothe, Missouri. At the end of a perfect summer day, the residents of Livingston County were settling down for the evening. It was peaceful and quiet, a normal summer evening in this rural farming community. We had a close-knit neighborhood, close neighbors, no crime rate, didn't lock doors, didn't worry about your home because the whole neighborhood kind of looked after it. It's rural Missouri. Generally, in law enforcement, for us, it's 99% boredom and 1% terror, if anything at all. The 20th of August in the neighboring state of Nebraska. Police received a panicky phone call from a drifter named Jack McCormick. He was one of the many transient workers in the Missouri area. He uh, traveled around all the time, went from mission to mission and picked up odd jobs here and there. That's about how they all were. All these guys were transients. You know, they all had families, but they didn't have much of a family life. Jack called, said he'd been working for a farmer, and told us it was Ray Copeland, and that he'd had some problems with him. McCormick told the police that Copeland, a farmer in Livingston County, had hired him to work on his farm. According to McCormick, Copeland promised him free room and board, plus a wage of $50 a day. They said, well, here's the deal. I'll set you up where you can live uh, with my wife and I. She'll cook and wash and clean for you. We'll feed you. Most of the farmers around here get help locally. It's very common to have somebody uh, to help you out. Jack told police that Ray had had another job in mind for him. Involvement in check fraud and a stolen cattle scam. Well, they'd paint them barn and stuff, then he would talk them into going to the sale barns with him and buying cattle. To Jack McCormick, desperate for paying work, it sounded like easy money. All he had to do was bid for the cattle Ray wanted, then write a check. At this particular juncture, there's no crime. You've committed no crime by going to an auction with me. This guy is just setting things up, and you're helping him out. But Ray's fraud became evident. He would have them buy the cows. They would write a check. He would take them up to the bank either prior to it or right after the sale, have them close the account out. Jack told police that Ray later resold the cattle at another sale miles away and kept the profit. When you go to a sale barn, uh, most of those people think, you know, they're, they're good down-to-earth farm people and they're buying cattle, so there's a trust factor there. And they're taking so many checks at a sale barn that they can't check each and every one of them. It worked pretty good for him for a while. After several days of taking part in the fraud, Jack got nervous. He'd already been in trouble with the law, and he wanted to make a clean break. Jack indicated that he was becoming somewhat suspicious of the business arrangement and wanted to sever his business ties with Ray. According to Jack, Ray didn't take the news well. 
McCormick told police that later that night, Ray woke him up and took him out to the barn. He was told that there was a raccoon behind uh, a bale of hay, and, and he was told to go over and see if he could scare it out, and, and Ray was going to shoot it. Well, Jack got suspicious and felt like that he was going to shoot him instead. He turned around this guy pointing the rifle at his head. And he asked him, are you going to kill me, Ray? For some reason, he wasn't shot and he escaped. The Nebraska police weren't sure what to make of McCormick's incredible story. A drifter and a known drinker, Jack had a reputation for being unreliable. He was a typical alcoholic, the best way to phrase it. I mean, he liked his alcohol. He liked to boast. He thought he was a ladies' man. Jack appeared to me to be, uh, I use the word slick, there was just something that just kind of made me uneasy about his whole story. But the police were intrigued by Jack's claims as to what he'd seen on the Copeland farm. Jack said that he'd seen what he believed was leg bones and skulls in these brush piles that Ray had burnt. Police were hard pressed to believe McCormick's accusations against 75-year-old Ray Copeland and his wife Faye. Longtime residents of Livingston County, the Copelands were a quiet farming couple of modest means and with modest tastes. These people were like the typical grandmother and grandfather. They worked hard. They uh, seemed to just lead real quiet lives. He looked like a typical Missouri farmer to me. He looked like a man who'd worked hard all his life. She looked like uh, grandma that you would go to on uh, Sunday and for Sunday dinner. And Ray worked all the time. Didn't do anything major, but he worked all the time cleaning farms up for people. Financially, Ray didn't have a lot. He lived from day to day like everybody else. Ray and Faye Copeland were living alone. Their children, now grown up and moved out, had had a strict upbringing. Whenever he would come home, that's whenever you towed the line as far as what you did around Ray. Now, don't get me wrong, some of my home life with mom was great. Still remember it today, but not with him. Although skeptical about Jack's story, the Nebraska police contacted Gary Calvert of Livingston County. No, Gary Calvert, he was our chief deputy. He took care of the investigations. Calvert was well respected in law enforcement circles and known as an intelligent and detailed investigator. Not satisfied with the appearance of a kindly old farmer and his wife, Calvert followed his instincts and dug deeper. A different picture of Ray Copeland emerged. The opinion of Ray with everybody in Livingston County is that Ray was, he was kind of a cantankerous old man. If he told you to do something, you did it then. If you didn't, you got to beat. Calvert initiated a thorough background check on the farmer with surprising results. He had had some criminal background. He would had some check problems at one time. I know he had filed bankruptcy a few years before all this happened. Faced with new information about Ray Copeland's criminal past, the deputy began to suspect that Jack McCormick's story about the cattle fraud could have some truth to it. It made it a little bit more believable that there was probably something going on that Jack maybe knew about, maybe didn't, but was talking about it. A single phone call to the Nebraska police hotline had set off a chain of events that was to lead to allegations of multiple murder and possibly the bloodiest killing spree in Missouri's history. August 1989. In the peaceful farming community of Livingston County, Missouri, a drifter named Jack McCormick made a shocking accusation against local farmer Ray Copeland. He claimed that Ray had tried to kill him after he pulled out of a dodgy business deal. 
Deputy Gary Calvert wasted no time investigating the possibility that Copeland was targeting transients in a check forging scam. Gary Calvert was a very good investigator. I think most deputies or sheriffs uh, at that time, if they'd got this information, there's a good chance that it might not have developed, but Gary stayed on it and kept pushing and kept looking. Calvert's tenacity paid off when he learned that the farmer's livestock scams had frequently landed him in prison. Ray Copeland was not new to a life of crime. He had been arrested on uh, several occasions for theft uh, and some of it was livestock. Ever since I remember, Ray would be gone every now and then. We were told he was gone and wouldn't be back for six, seven months. The next step in Calvert's investigation was to track down all Copeland's temporary workers. We knew we were looking for people that had been associated with Ray Copeland and had been writing bad checks for cattle. This was not an easy task. Calvert found that most of the workers didn't want to be discovered, especially by the police. There's really no track of some of them for maybe a couple of years, so security-wise, anything. And with them being uh, basically homeless people, there wasn't really anyone really looking for them either. Changing his tactics, Calvert attempted to track down the transient workers through their families. A few of them had family members, they hadn't seen them. Most of the time, though, they didn't have family that we could find. The ones that did and stuff, the family members hadn't heard from them, and that was kind of unusual, because they, they still contact your family once in a while. This raised Gary Calvert's suspicions. The transients who'd worked for Ray Copeland had one thing in common. They'd all gone missing. They would be gentlemen coming to the house staying through two or three nights, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Mom would feed them at the table, just like any of us kids, you know, part of the family type of deal. About four or five weeks, days, you know, however long he wanted to use them, and then all of a sudden they were gone. All except for Jack McCormick. Gary Calvert was eager to track down the mysterious drifter who had originally alerted the police. Jack was already on police radar for writing forged checks in nearby Sullivan County, the checks he had written for Copeland's cattle scheme. He was on parole, and because of the checks, he violated his parole. They issued a warrant for McCormick's arrest, then took that information and entered it into the uh, national database for wanted persons. Gary Calvert saw Jack's name in the database and contacted the Sullivan authorities. He informed them that he was looking for Jack. He didn't have long to wait. On the 13th of September, McCormick was found drunk by the side of the road. He was stuck in a ditch. I think he'd probably been out partying and ended up somewhere where he wasn't supposed to, and that's, they come across him that way. While processing McCormick's arrest, the authorities saw that he was wanted in Missouri. They contacted Gary Calvert, and Jack was immediately transferred back to Livingston County. Meanwhile, there was a second break in the case. Police talked to a transient named Jimmy Page, currently employed by Ray Copeland. Page was a farmhand. They still had up here. They hadn't had him up here very long. He had just been doing cleaning around the farm, helping Ray like the rest of them. Page corroborated Jack's story about Copeland's check scam down to the last detail. They would go to a cattle sale. The transit would have two or three hundred dollars in their checking account. They would write a check for three thousand dollars and then Ray would sell the cattle. Then these guys were left holding the bag. Basically he had somebody else committing his crimes and then he was the benefactor of, of everything. Led by Deputy Gary Calvert and Livingston County Sheriff Leland O'Dell, the Missouri police spent several weeks gathering evidence and taking statements from Jack McCormick. 
Well, he proceeded to tell about how this couple would go to Springfield, uh, pick up some transients, bring them up here in a cattle buying scheme. And then once he had bought some cattle, he felt like that these people were actually killing uh, these transients. Of course, as he's telling the story, I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, you are crazy. That, you know, this rural Missouri don't happen here. Jack McCormick indicated that he was a shiftless person and was prone to alcohol, but that the information that he had to offer was not coming from any uh, alcohol-induced state, that uh, what he was telling us was the truth. At which point in time he talked about seeing some bones. Police got Jack to draw a map of the farm, indicating the exact spot where he'd claimed to see human remains. Confident that he had enough proof, Gary Calvert applied for a warrant to search the farm and to arrest Ray Copeland. Being in a rural area, we don't have enough people to uh, dedicate to a major crime uh, of, this, of this sort. Realizing this, Calvert and Odell called in help from other authorities across the state. The agencies involved in the search warrant was the Livingston County Sheriff's Office, Chillicothe Police Department, uh, the Grundy County Sheriff's Office, and I believe at the time the Highway Patrol may have been involved also. Armed with the warrant, over 40 police officers gathered in Chillicothe in preparation for a massive search of the Copeland farm. But they were not prepared for a crime that was to grip this peaceful community, a crime that shocked even the most seasoned of police officers. Autumn 1989. The authorities prepared for a massive search of the farm belonging to 75-year-old Ray Copeland for a crime involving fraud, forgery, and an alleged serial killing. Our best information seemed to lead us to believe that there was, in fact, uh, murder in Livingston County, and we kept our investigation going. The 9th of October, 7 a.m., police raided the Copeland property. It was just uh, a typical rural Missouri farmhouse, uh, you know, had barns. It would just look like something a real old farmer would live in. The morning of the search warrant, my function was to interview Faye. Uh, Deputy Calvert's function was, along with serving the search warrant, was to find Ray and try to interview him. Ray wasn't there when, when we arrived. Uh, Faye was at the house, stayed with her for some time and talked to her. My first impression was she was just a, a little old lady. She's from the old school. You know, he's the head of the household, so she does what he says. That's, that's just the way it was in that family. Faye denied any knowledge of her husband's cattle scam. She told us we didn't have any business there, and you know she didn't know anything about her husband's business. I felt she knew what was happening, as what was going on. I, she couldn't keep from knowing what was going on. At the time of the search, Ray was in town having coffee at the local diner. Deputy Gary Calvert made the arrest. Ray was found, and he was. they were both taken into the Livingston County uh, facility. Ray was initially held on the check scheme cattle scheme. Both Ray and Faye Copeland maintained their innocence regarding Jack's allegations of human remains on the property. Ray made the comment, we can look on each farm all we want, but we would never find anything there. The authorities informed the Copeland children of their parents' arrest. There isn't any one of us affected whenever Ray was arrested, but uh, being affected when her mom was arrested, yeah, each and every one of us pretty well de devastated about it. It happened to Ray all the time, but this is the first time that Faye was ever involved in it. 
Fay appealed to her children for help. Don't let them touch a certain item in the house. Uh, the quilts, take them out before they even get there. She didn't want them touching any of her pictures. Get them out of there. I can't do that, Mom. Yes, you can. Just go in there overnight and take them out of there. No, I can't. There are police there all 24 hours a day. They're evidence. The major case squad continued its search of the Copeland property. We went out and spent several days on his farm out there looking around. We went through all the burn piles where he'd burnt brush stuff looking for bones. Sniffer dogs and specialist equipment were brought in to assist with the search. We dug holes all over that farm for two days, three days. Before long, the local news media had caught on to the police investigation. In 1989, I was a general assignment reporter at the Post. I was asked to go out there. There were a lot of locals there, and there was some media there. I really don't recall how it becomes such hot news so quick, but uh, we hadn't been there very long, and uh, the, the satellite trucks started showing up, and, and it, it just became common knowledge. I remember the, um, the police officials being very cautious uh, because there were no bodies. All they had was speculation and a belief that there uh, may have been some people who were killed in the, in the area, people who had gone missing. So they were very careful in what they were doing, the information that they were releasing. And we're out here in rural Missouri, numerous television stations with all sorts of press was there, cameras and lights. And we were telling people that we was investigating a cattle buying scheme. But the word got out that we were basically looking for bodies, not officially, but everybody knew that that's what we were doing. News of the search for bodies spread across Livingston County. I remember people standing on top of their pickup trucks, uh, looking with binoculars or trying to get as close as they could to uh, take snapshots with their, you know, little cameras. There were a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation on what might be there. Some neighbors said it was just a um, witch hunt. The authorities made every effort to remain discreet and focused on the task at hand. But after nearly a week of searching, the police were still empty-handed. We never found anything on his property that led us to believe that there would be bodies there. Found several bones. None of them turned out to be human. Again, police wondered whether Jack McCormick was lying to them about the body parts in order to cover his role in the check fraud. He was kind of the center of attention for a while, and I was curious or whether or not Jack was just playing up to us and telling us what we wanted to hear. There were a lot of people who thought that Jack McCormick was just kind of crazy, that uh, for whatever reason, he was trying to bring attention uh, to himself. People were saying that we were foolish and looking like fools, and that's the last thing anybody wants to be done is made a fool of. And, and still in the back of your mind, you're thinking, are we chasing ghosts here, or are we actually on to something? The police were discouraged, but unwilling to give up. They continued to follow every lead connected to Ray Copeland. The neighbors would tell us that Ray had access to a lot of the different properties, not necessarily permission to be on them, but would have access to them. Teams of officers searched the surrounding barns that Ray was known to use and interviewed farm owners. When an individual was interviewed and Ray Copeland had either been on his farm or done work for him on his farm, we would search those areas and talk to other people in the surrounding area to see if they'd seen anything suspicious. Livingston County is just covered with wells and ponds and places that you know you could put bodies that whenever I was around the farm finding areas like where they had burned tires and uh, it had animal bones in it. You had a feeling like something bad had happened there. 
On the 17th of October, officers Kurt Reith and Paul Stegmaier searched a barn owned by farmer Neil Bryan. So we came out and investigated it. We pried the door open and went in. Took the steel rod and started probing around in the inside of the barn. Came across three places that wasn't right. I think law enforcement officers have those feelings whenever they work different things. It's like uh, being in a really bad place and you sense it and you know it. Got a couple of shovels. We started digging. We dug down 18 inches to 24 inches. We uncovered a pair of tennis shoes in one, uncovered plastic in the other two. As the officers continued to dig, they discovered the remains of three murdered men. They all were all buried inside this barn. They were wrapped in plastic with their clothing on. The three men were later identified as 21-year-old Paul Cowart from Arkansas, 27-year-old John Freeman from Oklahoma, and 27-year-old Jimmy Harvey from Missouri. All three men had been transient workers who had mysteriously disappeared. They were also former employees of Ray Copeland. I was so surprised when we found the three bodies that it made me a little bit uneasy with my judgment. <laughs> this is an elderly couple that could have been my grandparents. It just didn't seem possible to me that these two elderly people were able to kill these younger gentlemen and dispose of the bodies. The bodies were removed and taken to the local mortuary for further investigation. One of the first body was found. My job was to uh, photograph the body and anything that he would point out, like if uh, there was a hole in a skull. From what we determined uh, through the autopsies in our investigation, we felt that uh, the victims died of a gunshot wound to the back of the head, probably a 22 rifle. We felt that they were not killed at the location that they were found. They were killed somewhere else and, and brought to that location and buried. The killings and the cold-blooded manner of the burials shocked the officers involved in the case. You know, I'd seen dead people before, but for me to be actually photographing victims of uh, a serial killer, it just was really strange for me. And I was asked one time if I'd ever had felt the presence of evil, which uh, sounds a little bit strange, but at that time I did. It didn't take long for news of the murdered men to spread through the community. We waited until the bodies had been removed, and then we prepared a press release and passed out the information. This caught a lot of people by shock, thinking that, no, this, this don't happen here. This happens in the city. Uh, but uh, they were proven wrong. Ray and Faye Copeland, already under arrest for fraud and forgery, were charged with the murder of the three men. Livingston locals were shocked to learn of the brutal nature of the crime and the age of the two accused. What they didn't realize was that the body count wasn't yet finished. October 1989. Missouri police arrested Ray and Faye Copeland for the murder of three transient workers found buried in a barn on a neighboring farm. The elderly couple were locked in separate cells in Livingston County Jail. It wasn't until the three bodies were found that this story became real for a lot of people. And I, and I think the mood of, of everybody, the, the, the press, uh, law enforcement, and the community, and the people that the Copelands knew changed uh, dramatically. It was no longer uh, a joke and something fun and something kind of silly and something to, you know, to take pictures of and to look at through your binoculars. Suddenly it became very, very serious and, uh, and I think the community felt that instantly. 
the amazement of the neighborhood and the community that something like this would even happen in such an area. But what people found most difficult to comprehend was that 68-year-old Faye Copeland could be a cold-blooded killer. Whenever they changed the arrest to murders, whenever they had mom involved in it, then it really shook me up, all of us. The Copelands denied any knowledge of the killings. Yeah, whenever Ray Copeland told me that he was getting out of there, that felt like he was being defiant, like, um, you haven't caught me doing anything. It's kind of like he was letting me know, I didn't do this, and I didn't do anything, and I'm going to get out of here. With the Copelands behind bars, the investigation team continued to search the local area for further possible victims. Normally in a homicide investigation, you discover a body and you have a crime scene and you're looking for a suspect. Uh, in this particular case, we're in reverse. Now, we have two suspects. We're looking for the crime scene and the bodies. We went back to chasing leads just like we had been doing in, in the beginning. Our investigators were interested in searching any other barns that Ray Copeland had access to. We enjoyed great cooperation of the community that would call in indicating to us that Ray Copeland had been seen in various areas of the county. Our officers would respond to those areas and probe the dirt floors of the machine sheds or barns. The 25th of October, 1989. Buried underneath hundreds of bales of hay, police found another disturbing scene. We discovered the fourth body, later identified as Wayne Warner, in another barn. Warner had been killed in the same manner as the other victims with a single small caliber gunshot wound to the back of the head. Further investigation resulted in another discovery in a nearby well. Sam Stegmeyer, wife of officer Paul Stegmeyer, was one of the Livingston County residents that had volunteered to help with the search. And they were all standing around the well looking in, and the light was so that it reflected off the water. And I happened to have a hood on, and that deflected the light enough that I could see the belt on this man, and it appeared to be a body. Upon closer examination, police confirmed Sam's suspicions. Only yards from where the fourth victim was found, another body had been discovered. After carefully retrieving it, police immediately sent the body to the county mortuary. Whenever we got the body back to the, uh, the morgue, we uh, had rolled it over and he had on a leather belt that said Murphy on the back. The body was later identified as Dennis Murphy. Like the previous murder victims, Murphy had been an employee of Ray Copeland. And the five bodies had something else in common. So we have evidence that all of the victims were shot in the back of the head. Officers at the Copeland property continued to search the farmhouse. It just looked like a very old farmhouse. Hadn't had much done to it since it was built, probably. Every item inside the house was a potential piece of evidence. Before long, police found something they believed could be crucial. That we found a, a small caliber handgun and a 22 rifle and I believe some type of shotgun. They were standing in the corner of one of the rooms, in, in the master bedroom. The bullets were examining, these were fired from this particular rifle question, and no other one like it. It's like fingerprints to 
forensics. We also found laundered clothing that we did not believe that Ray or Faye Copeland would be able to wear. There were several clothing items, different sizes of uh, blue jeans that we felt come from the different, different uh, people that had been in and out of that house. The families identified different uh, pieces of clothing that had been worn by the victims. I believe some of the clothing actually had some of the victims' initials in them. With the search almost complete, police came across what appeared to be the most damning piece of physical evidence of Faye Copeland's involvement in the crimes. A list was found in the house that had several names on that list, and the, the bodies that we found all had an X beside the name, which led us to believe the X's meant that they were deceased. You know, and that was pretty crucial. And it was in Faye's handwriting. She obviously knew that these people were dead because they had been X'd off of her list. During the initial interview with Faye, uh, she indicated she'd never heard of those people, never heard those names before. She told the police, she told me, Ray told her, put an X beside. You gotta understand how they lived, how they were grown up. You did what your husband told you to do. Ray could not write legible enough for anyone to read it, including himself. He had mom do it. I know that. Mom told even the police department that she had written them down for him. And then they asked her, you know, well, who are they? I don't know. Ray just told me to write them down. The case against Ray and Faye Copeland became more compelling with every piece of evidence. But if they were responsible for the brutal murders of the five young men, how many others had they killed? There were others that had exes. We felt like there was probably other bodies that we didn't find. The authorities were optimistic that things were going their way. Jack McCormick and Jimmy Page, two former employees of Ray Copeland, were prepared to testify. Physical evidence included a firearm matching the victim's wounds and a handwritten hit list with the names of the deceased. The final and the most damning evidence was the recovered bodies of the victims themselves, dumped, discarded, and buried across Livingston County. Reaction on the streets of Livingston County ranged from denial and disbelief to cries of outrage. It was shocking. They just couldn't feature something like that happening in their area. It's just hard for people to believe. November 1989. The media descended upon Chillicothe to cover one of the biggest local stories in decades. Of course, you're talking basically about a serial killer or serial killers. So it, it was big news. Reporter Bill Smith was one of the few journalists that managed to get an interview with Ray Copeland. When he was telling me that, uh, that he was innocent, I remember this, getting this kind of chill about him. And I don't know if it was his eyes or his mannerism or, or what it was. At that point, you know, I went from believing he was a kindly, grandfatherly sort to really knowing that, uh, that he had done what he was accused of doing and feeling very strongly that he had it within himself to kill these men over a few thousand dollars. Most of the shock and disbelief was directed at Faye Copeland. Still find it hard to believe that it happened. At that time, she would have been about the age I am now, and I would just have expected her to be the typical grandmother. Believing Faye knew more than she was saying, the prosecution offered her a deal in exchange for testifying against her husband. We thought that Faye would be the one that would be most likely to cooperate with us. 
Early on, the uh, prosecution had talked to her and indicated to her that if she cooperated with us in uh, location of, of all victims, that they would recommend a light sentence. She refused to do that, and so consequently, we had to do things uh, the hard way. The 13th of November, Ray and Faye Copeland faced multiple murder charges, and separate trial dates were set. Both the accused firmly maintained their innocence throughout, but with overwhelming evidence stacked against them, the trials didn't last long. By March 1991, both Ray and Faye had been found guilty of murder in the first degree. Faye Copeland was convicted and received four death penalties. Ray was convicted and received uh, the death penalty on fi all five counts. The sentences brought varied reactions from the family and members of the community. It was mixed. You know, it wasn't everybody jumping up and down saying, yeah, they, they, they got what they deserved because some people felt like Faye was a victim. Even today, you know, a lot of people ask the question, well, why didn't Mom know what Ray did? Why didn't she speak out? I think at last she did know and, and she knew how she had to tell somebody. She just didn't get it told quick enough. Whether or not Faye was actually there during that, it was never determined. You know, as, as far as I'm concerned, she knew what was going on. Uh, she'll, they'll never convince me that she didn't. But uh, the way he treated her, though, it wouldn't have surprised me if he had her dig the hole. He killed a lot of people. No question in my mind. All because he wanted to be better than everybody else. Mom's guilty very simply of loving him way too much and not understanding that love is different than what she thought it was. Almost 20 years later, the impact of the Copeland killings remains strong in people's memories. The rural idyll of Livingston County had been shattered. The community I believe looks at it as like a black eye because we had a serial killer here. What makes the Copelands, Faye and Ray Copeland, unique in this was their age. Serial killers, you don't necessarily think of somebody 70 years old and husband and wife type uh, scenario. Uh, they were the oldest people on death row. Uh, so it, it was a unique case. In the end, Neither Ray nor Faye Copeland had to face the executioner. Ray died in prison before his death sentence could be carried out. Faye's death sentence was, uh, was overturned in 1999, but after additional health problems, she was finally paroled to a uh, nursing center. In December 2004, Faye Copeland died of natural causes. There are some of us that still believe that there are other undiscovered bodies somewhere in Livingston County that we don't know anything about. It wasn't a perfect crime but it was something that we, you know, any person could see was doable because uh, who's going to tell later? Uh, who's going to miss them? Most of their families had probably given up on them years ago. I guess we grow up uh, believing uh, that if you're evil, that you're, or if you do something bad, you're wearing a black cloak and hiding in the shadows. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is what do they look like? Anybody. Anybody, anywhere.